Hello and welcome to my channel. Now this is a heads up because this is a re-upload. Unfortunately I was hit with a copyright strike. Now I contacted the YouTube channel that hit me with this copyright strike and I tried to explain to them that I wasn't actually um, stealing their work and I wasn't trying to claim it was my work and I in fact put a credit in the corner, I put a credit at the end of my video in the, in the credits and I put a link in the bottom down below in the comment section on YouTube. So I clearly wasn't stealing their uh, content. But they wouldn't have it and they wouldn't remove the copyright strike. So I've had to redo this video. I've deleted their scene and put a different scene in its place. And also I've decided I've unsubscribed from that channel. I shan't be watching any more of their content because what's the point? Because if I watch one of their videos and think, oh, that's good, maybe I should put a clip in my video so if you lot can watch it and maybe you want to go to their channel and subscribe to their channel, well, there's no point because I'll just get hit with a copyright strike. So anyway, I've babbled on long enough. Sorry for that. This is a re-upload. You can click off now if you've already seen it. If not, roll credits. And welcome back to another episode of Project Supercar. Now, if you're building your own supercar, one of the things you're going to have to consider is the aerodynamic properties of the car. Now, many race cars and supercars have a flat under tray, and my car is no different, and we're going to cover that in this episode. Now before we go into the undertray on this car, I just thought I'd let you know that when I was building this car, YouTube didn't really exist and I had no intention of doing a YouTube channel. However, I did take loads of pictures because I thought I might do a book on how to build your own supercar. Now, the idea was, uh, when I started doing these videos, was to incorporate some of these photos into the videos and show you how I built this car. But uh, I, put some, I have put some photos in there, but I keep forgetting. So um, I think what we'll do is I'm going to put some images on the screen now and we'll just have a recap from the last episode when we were doing the steering and the front suspension. Now, when you're building your own supercar, it isn't a linear process. It's not like you just build one part and then another and another. You have to build it up, you mock it up, you make sure everything fits, and then you take it apart again. So it's like two steps forward, one step back. So here's the, uh, the front of the raw chassis before it was painted and before it is um, finished. So I use this to mock up the front suspension. I then remove the front suspension and as you can see I uh, powder coated the wishbones and I refurbed the brake calipers and painted the front hubs, re-greased and put new bearings in, that sort of thing. So there's a few photos, here we go, there's a closer shot. And there you go again, you can see the calipers, clean them all up, and um, these are just standard BMW E46 calipers. And there's another shot. Now this is the suspension all fitted back onto the raw chassis. So the chassis hasn't been painted or even finished at this stage, but I had to fit the chassis, uh, sorry, the suspension back on so I could get a rolling chassis. Here's another angle, you can see that the upper wishbone is slightly tilted up a little bit. And you can also see the exaggerated camber, or the negative camber on that disc. That, that, that hasn't been set up yet, that's just mocked up. Here's uh, another picture, another angle, you can see the top hat, the, that's the green thing in the centre of the picture there. Uh, that can be rotated and it can adjust the caster angle of the hub. 
there's another angle on the other side of the chassis there's the other side the, again and that's just all the uh, wishbones that have been powder coated and that bar that runs across there that's the front strut brace here's a close up of some of the wishbone parts there we go and there's another shot of the uh, front brace bar and I think that'll do for now so what we'll do is we'll get on to the, uh, the under tray no, we're not going to do the under tray just yet. Um, the reason I just showed you those clips of those images is when I'm doing these videos, I'm trying to do it in the order that I did the build. And it follows the images that I, that I took while I was building this car. Now, we did the steering and everything in the last episode. After I'd done the steering on this, I moved to the dashboard. Now what I really wanted to do is to pull this dashboard out, show you how I did all that and then I wanted to compare it with the other dashboard in the donor car. Now the problem is, this dash is still in the car. Now I do plan on obviously pulling this out and then doing an episode for you and showing you how this all comes out and we'll have a look at the air conditioning, all the cabling and all that sort of stuff. But because of the weather, I am so far behind on the strip down on this car, it's not even funny. But uh, it means that my schedule of the episodes are not in sync anymore. So we're going to have to skip a few episodes and we won't be covering the dashboard for a, for a bit. So we'll do the under tray and probably a couple of others, which I, which I did in the future. And then what we'll do is go back to the dashboard when I finally get this removed. So we'll get back to the dashboard once I've pulled the interior out of that donor car, which hopefully should be in a week or two. Fingers crossed that it doesn't rain, by the way. Now, when I was designing this supercar, there was a couple of design elements that I wanted to incorporate. Um, I wanted a completely flat under tray or floor on this thing, for two reasons. Uh, one, I wanted total protection of all the exhaust, cooling system, um, cabling and everything, so I wanted it all protected because I live in the UK and if I wanted to drive this thing in uh, the winter it's going to get covered in uh, salt and sleet and that sort of stuff. So I wanted an under tray that would protect everything under the car and I also need it for aerodynamic properties because I want it to be super smooth under here so it doesn't cause any turbulence like this video explains. The iconic Porsche 917 was born. Its birth was not without its share of difficulties. Early on, it was plagued with aerodynamic instability. This new formula of high power and low drag was a new concept to Porsche and it took them some time to perfect it. But they gradually reprofiled the bodywork and the 917 began to dominate races in the early 70s. This progression hit a boiling point with the accidental discovery of ground effect with the Lotus Type 78. During the development of the Type 78, the head engineer, Peter Wright, and his team were experimenting with prototypes of a new design for aerofoil side pods in the Imperial College London wind tunnel. Over the course of the day, the rudimentary prototype wings began to sag towards the ground of the wind tunnel, and to the amazement of the team, there was a huge increase in downforce. Initially, they didn't understand what was causing the increase, but soon discovered that by adding cardboard skirts to the side pods, air was being forced and trapped beneath the car. And as we discussed in previous videos, when air is forced through a constriction, it experiences an increase in speed and a decrease in pressure. This is called the Venturi effect. They later developed these brush skirts that sealed the air under the car, which were later replaced with rubber skirts. This low pressure air relative to the high pressure air flowing over the car caused a huge increase in downforce with only a marginal increase in drag, making the car stick to the road in corners and reach incredible speeds on the streets. Getting the aerodynamics right on your supercar is complicated and it is a science all on its own. It's not something you can really guess at. Now, hopefully, in the future, if I have the money, then I would like to take this thing into a wind tunnel and tweak the aerodynamics of this car and make sure it's pretty good. Um, I would like to put a rear wing on the back, but for now I've decided to leave it off because I can't really test it. I don't really know if it would actually work. Now, 
if there's many, many race teams out there that work on aerodynamics, and even the best of them can get it wrong sometimes. Now, I was trying to find some good footage on YouTube showing you the underside of a race car, but it is pretty difficult to film. On the side of the vehicle, you'll notice these side skirts, which are in place to help prevent high pressure air from moving underneath the vehicle. You'll also notice they're vented. These front vents here are to help cool the catalytic converter, which is located just behind the front tire. And you've also got vents here to help cool the exhaust. And also at the very back of the side skirt, You've got these vents here to allow for airflow to flow through the exhaust, help cool it, and then back out through the side skirt. Underneath the car, you'll notice a completely flat and smooth under tray, which is used to minimize drag and minimize turbulence underneath the vehicle. All of this air eventually exits through the rear through the diffuser, which is used to maximize the pressure differential between the top of the car and below the car. You can't really get the camera in. Now, I can try with my phone. Let's see if I can crawl down here like this. And We'll see what sort of images I can pick up. Here we go. Okay. Well, you can see a little bit. Well, it's pretty flat under there. But... But I think you guys want to see a little bit more than some shaky cam done on my camera. Now because I can't really get this car up in the air and show you the under tray, I'm going to show you a series of photographs that I took when I was building this car. So the whole chassis was mopped up and then stripped and then it was painted. As you can see the chassis is completely bare uh, I just painted it with hammerite just to protect it so it wouldn't rust. Um, this is the prototype chassis, so I might have to grind some of this paint off to weld on some um, added parts. Now, you can just about make out in this shot uh, a series of aluminium panels. There we go. It's um, laid out on my living room floor. So these are the panels that are pot riveted and also bolted to the underside of this car. There's the chassis upside down in my garage, with some of the parts, some of the panels have already been pot riveted onto the underside of the chassis. These are some nut rivets. This is the underside of where the engine goes. Here's another shot of the uh, area where the uh, engine lives. Here's another shot. Now, those two tubes you can see there they are coolant pipes and they run down the center of the car. Now the problem is, is if I fit those tubes into the chassis and then I pot rivet an aluminium panel over those tubes, I can't unbolt them if I ever need to remove them. So I had to make the aluminium paneling removable. Uh, this is the mounting bracket for the gear lever. Now we'll get into gear changes and all that sort of stuff in another episode. Um, so we'll just have a quick sneak peek of the gear lever, that's, on, that's another photo, there's the gear lever upside down, um, we'll, we'll touch that in, in another episode. Anyway, there's the cooler pipes bolted into the chassis 
with the panel removed. It's a removable panel, so I can get to these pipes if I need to. There's the uh, bolts close up. There's another shot. Remember, this is the chassis upside down. And more, more shots of, the, of those bolts. There's the coolant pipes. That's just poking into the engine bay area. That's the uh, engine mount, obviously upside down. And just another angle of that engine mount. Now you can see all the pot, pot not pot rivets, uh, nut rivet inserts, which I put into the chassis. There's the panel that covers the cooling pipes and it's bolted into place. There it is from another angle. And there is the engine bay under tray, which is removable. There's another angle, looking at it a bit lower down. And there it is even lower. You can see that the, the, the bottom of this car is totally flat. Oh, and there, that's the panels mocked up before any pot riveting was done or any drilling was done at all. So that's just making sure all the panels fitted before I did any drilling. And then we are back at the chassis. So, yes, this has a complete flat under tray, so it's good for aerodynamics, it protects the uh, mechanical parts of the car, parts of the under tray are removable and the rest is pot riveted and also sealed for weather protection. If you've been following along with my videos, you probably know by now I don't like rust and I want to make sure that this chassis is completely protected. Now one of the things I've designed is the under tray here is obviously pot riveted and is glued, it's sealed, but then the side skirt that bolts onto this, it actually goes underneath the tray. So let's get the camera lined up. So the idea is, is it will go underneath there, something like that, so it, and it will be sealed again, so hopefully no water will get in to rust this chassis out. And another thing I want to do is I want to fit a sacrificial aluminium strip that will run along both sides of the car. Do you know those pesky speed bumps that always scratches the exhaust and all the rest of it and puts cracks in your alloy wheels? Well, I'm worried that those speed bumps are gonna damage the under tray. So if I run two very long aluminum strips down each side of the car, quite thick, then that should protect the under tray. They're sacrificial, so they'll scrape on the uh, speed bump first and then you could you know, unscrew them and put new ones on every few years or something. It should protect the under tray from those speed bumps. Do you remember when I pulled the intercoolers off the new donor car, the 2.7T, and it looks like they're not going to work on my supercar? Well, I thought um, I'll have a look on the internet and see if I could find some replacements. So, I had a quick look. If you take a look at this one, uh, these are RS4, by the way, RS4 2.7T, they're virtually the same car really under the skin. Um, so I had a look at these, but, but uh, yeah, these are £1,274.99p. Look good, don't get me wrong, but uh, it's a little bit out of my budget. So I uh, carried on looking and I found another set. Now these RS4 intercoolers, they look the same. So each side of the car, um, it looks like it, it could work. I think it could work, but again, it's $1,699.99, but that could be a possibility. And here we go again, I found some others, uh, $1,299. Again, these intercoolers, they look mirrored. So they look like they're the same for each side. Now I found these. Now either this is a typo or these are some super duper intercoolers, but these are $9,995. Whoa! Okay, it's a little bit out of the, uh, the budget for me. Um, but I found these. These are from Project B5 in America. So they look quite good, uh, $699, now that's my sort of money. 
Um, oh yeah, I'm also thinking, if I can't quite um, get some performance intercoolers, then maybe I could get intercoolers from another car. Now as far as I know, it's only Volkswagen and Audi that have twin intercoolers at the front. I don't know any makes. If you out there, if you know of any makes that have twin intercoolers, uh, please make a comment and I'll go and research it. But I looked at these, um, these are 2 litre TDI intercoolers and they're 569 euros and they look, I mean the bracket's a little bit, it could be uh, changed and chopped but the intercoolers themselves look like they are the same either side. I don't know how big they are, I don't know, don't know how efficient they are but this could be a way that I could get this in budget if I just buy some uh, intercoolers that are from another car. So I think that's another episode in the bag, but before you go, I first thought I'd let you know I'm experiencing some uh, weird goings on with YouTube. Just take a look at these videos. This is a bit strange. When I take a look at a video I uploaded 21 hours ago, which will be the Lotus Elan Plus 2, it says no views. Okay, so no one wanted to look at the Lotus Elan Plus 2 in 21 hours. Okay. However, if I take a look at my Creator Studio, and there's the Lotus Elan Plus 2, and we go over to here, it says 9 views. So what is it? Has no one seen it, or has 9 people seen it? And there's something strange going on with my YouTube channel, and I can't explain why. So I don't know what's going on with my view. Something weird's going on. Anyway, something that's even more annoying is I uploaded a video of a Rafo on one of my uh, minute tour videos. Just a minute long video walking around this um, kit car. Now, there's an interesting conversation going on between uh, Melissa, hello Melissa, and uh, wood domain but for some unknown reason I can only see Melissa's comments and I can't see what wood domain is talking about they're blank to me I don't know what's going on now he's subscribed to my channel and I'm sub sus I'm subscribed to his channel so it's not like we're blocked or anything but YouTube sort yourself out because it's getting frustrating anyway I'd like to say thanks to everyone on DTube because as someone else pointed out I'm getting way more views on DTube and on BitTube than I am on YouTube. Oh, everyone on DTube that has upvoted my videos, thanks a lot, I really do appreciate that. I can see the old cryptocurrency going up. Keep it up, fantastic! Anyway, I think that'll, that'll do, hopefully this video is not going to be too long, so I'm going to call it an episode, it's done, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.